Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's lecture, which will be on Suiza Frontier, the world's first uh, hydro liquefied hydrogen carrier. Before I introduce you to our speaker, I'd just like to, to run through a, a, a quick um, housekeeping on, on how the Q&A session will work. Uh, for those of you who have not attended one of our lectures before, we hold the Q&A session at the end of the lecture, and you'll be able to ask your question in one of three ways. You can firstly uh, raise your hand, and uh, I will then um, promote you to the level of panelist. You'll be allowed to speak, um, and you can then ask any follow-up questions. However, you will be recorded and included on the video which we uploaded to YouTube. So if you don't want to be recorded, you can type your question into either the Q&A uh, box or the general chat box, and I will read your question out at the end and our speaker will answer it. So tonight's speaker is Amr Saeed. And uh, Amr is, uh, works for, uh, hang on a sec, works for, is a project manager in Shell Shipping Technology, and he's been working on liquefied hydrogen projects since 2013. He has over 27 years experience of ship operations, ship management, ship quality assurance, ship design review, assurance and shipbuilding project management. And out of this, over 19 years has been working with liquefied gases, predominantly LNG. He's been involved in the development of various industry standards and takes an active role in industry bodies like Ockham. He's been involved in IMO code development and has also taken an active role in developing rules for future liquefied hydrogen vessels. So without further ado, uh, I would like to invite our speaker to uh, share his screen and to uh, start his lecture. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, I can. Perfect. So, uh, hi, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Emer Said, uh, and I'm the project manager, uh, Shell project manager for the Hystra project. Uh, part of the project was building the uh, the vessel, which you can see on the screen. Her name is. Um, uh, I'm going to stop you there. You're not actually showing the screen at the moment. Uh, let me try again. Let me know when you can see it, please. I can see it now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so the vessel, uh, the the vessel which you see on the screen, I was talking about that one. Uh, this is uh, the Suiso Frontier, uh, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so my intent is to to talk about the hydrogen opportunities, uh, some of the challenges. Uh, also the novel technologies and the novel systems uh, which are installed on board the vessel and take you all the way through to the demonstration tests which we have conducted on the vessel. Before we delve into the topic of today, let me show you the standard note, the disclaimer, which we are supposed to include in the external presentations. Don't worry, I'm not going to read it and won't ask you to read it either uh, because the today's presentation is all about technical information sharing and do not have any uh, commercial con uh, content in it. Transport accounts for about one-fifth of global energy related CO2 emissions and with the growing population and prosperity in longer term demand is expected to increase significantly over the next few decades. How this transport sector will evolve, which fuels are going to be utilized, what measures are going to be taken will have a significant impact on the climate change. Shipping is the most efficient way of moving goods around the world and is expected to remain so uh, in the times to come. And we'll have to meet all this growing global demand for energy and, and transportation of cargo. Share of shipping emissions in global anthropogenic GHG emissions has increased from 2.76% to 2.89% in 2018, where carbon intensity, CO2 emissions per transport work has improved for the international shipping as a whole 
as well as most of the ship types, overall CO2 equivalent emissions have actually increased over time. When looking forward, it's expected, uh, the CO2 emissions are expected to increase from 90 to 130% in comparison to 2008 levels as per the IMO GIG study conducted in 2020. Where on one hand, this increase is plausible, IMO has also put the restrictions to reduce the CO2 emissions by 50% when compared to 2008 levels. This certainly poses requirements for shipping to find solutions for reducing carbon footprint, which can be achieved from various means like continued design optimization, increasing fuel efficiencies, installing some novel technologies, novel solutions, or perhaps to, to opt for more radical means like use of alternative fuels. Hydrogen is a cleaner solution. One such potential fuel, which is a clean alternative or could be a clean alternative as compared to the conventional fuels which are utilized in the shipping industry as of today. Hydrogen is already utilized in various industries. It's used in chemical industry and for generation of ammonia, for agriculture fertilizer, et cetera, or production of methanol, which is used in plastic pharmaceuticals, et cetera, or in hydrogenation of oils, or in glass industry, et cetera. In aerospace industry, it's certainly utilized as fuel as well for decades. Hydrogen is available. It's quite essential because it's part of water molecule. However, in the earth atmosphere, it's less than a PPM in the atmosphere. It can be produced, or it's if I, if I say at present, it's mostly produced from the fossil fuels, from methane reforming, so CH4 removing the carbon part. However, it can also be produced from electrolysis of water. And if it is utilized, uh, if the renewables are utilized for production of uh, from hydrogen, then the overall carbon footprint can be very low from well to wake, which is indeed a key uh, consideration. When it's used in the fuel cells, then it has a potential of virtually eliminating the SOX, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, black carbon, etc., and also CO2, which what it means is pretty much generated, generating from water and returning to water after it's oxidized. So hydrogen molecule certainly provides the opportunity to store that cyclical nature of renewable energy, which could go at waste in a molecule which can be utilized, transported and used on demand. Considering the potential of hydrogen, CO2-free hydrogen energy supply chain concept was proposed back in 2009, so over a decade ago. Concept pursuited of hydrogen generation and liquefaction in Australia and marine transportation by bulk into Japan for consumption into various industries, including transport sector, power generation, and heavy industries. This project was planned to be executed in two phases. One is the pilot project. This is where we fit in. And a commercial phase, which was supposed to follow suit after the successful demonstration of the pilot chain. Shell, in collaboration with Iwatani Corporation, J Power and Kawasaki Heavy Industries, has been participating in this Japanese government subsidized project. Where Hystra 
in, initially composed of four uh, founding board members, which was KHI, Shell, Kivatani, and J Power. It, the membership has increased and the level of interest has certainly increased as well. Among the four founding partners, every partner had a, had a role and Kawasaki Heavy Industries was, uh, has designed and constructed the uh, carrier, the ship, in collaboration with Shell. And ship is under operations at present by the Shell Fleet Operations Team. Kawasaki Heavy Industry has also built the terminal in Kobe at Port Island. And the terminal is being operated by Iwatani. J Power has predominantly been involved in the Australian part of the project where Shell has not been part of. Where hydrogen presents a value proposition for potential emission reductions, it poses certain challenges as well which requires effective management. Some of the properties of hydrogen are somewhat different to the liquefied gases, which we are used to of transporting today. And this slide attempts to compare LH2 and LNG risks in a subjective manner. An important point is that there is more uncertainty relating to liquefied hydrogen risks. And research has been ongoing to quantify those risks so that more appropriate mitigations can be introduced. To help you understand and read the slide, the text is shown in three different colors, green, red, and black, where the green test text indicates somewhat less hazardous or riskier. Red is more hazardous and riskier, and black is where it's kind of indifferent or comparative. Starting from, from the bottom up, rapid phase transition, as we all know, those who have been dealing with the liquefied gases, is a phenomenon which occurs when a very cold liquid comes into contact with a warm liquid. And in our case, liquefied hydrogen or LNG coming into contact with seawater. And the rapid vaporization of the cryogen can lead to significant overpressures. As we have noted that in the LNG industry as well. Such risk associated with LNG, uh, with LH2 or liquefied hydrogen is relatively lower because the amount of energy contained is lower. Dispersion from the spill, the next bar up, when the hydrogen or the liquefied hydrogen releases, it quickly evaporates. It forms a bigger vapor cloud, but it's also very buoyant. So it moves very quickly upwards. And when it moves upwards, it moves away from the ignition sources, which are predominantly on the ground levels. Hence, their overall risk from this is considered to be lower in comparison to LNG case. Looking at the pool and jet fires, due to the wider flammability range of 4% to approximately 75% for hydrogen in comparison to roughly about 5 to 15% for methane, hydrogen release is more likely to ignite and poses a higher risk. The fires are also said to be less visible in comparison because of the lack of carbon content. However, it can be made visible by the surrounding effects like burning of paint, etc. Hence, it's considered more overall, it's considered more riskier uh, as compared to LNG case. Looking into explosions, hydrogen vapor cloud is much more likely to explode. It has got much wider range of explosive range as compared to LNG or methane case. The explosions don't only occur in confinement, but it can also occur in congestions. So that is again more riskier 
in case of hydrogen as compared to LNG. And there's also a phenomena of DDT, which is deflagration to detonation transition, which is also applicable in case of a hydrogen where it can self detonate or continue to support its uh, detonation, leading to significant overpressures, which can damage the assets or perhaps uh, impact on the personnel. Looking at Blevy, which is boiling liquid expanding vapor explosions. That phenomena also remains applicable to liquefied hydrogen, like a pretty much similar to LNG case. However, based on the recent testing which we have conducted, we recognize that the risk of Blevy's are less in comparison to LNG case. So key considerations what we had for LH2 was to make sure that it does not, we do not lose the primary containment within the project. We must contain the liquefied or gaseous hydrogen well where it should be. Otherwise, whenever we look into the mitigation measures, then coming down to ALAP, which is as low as reasonably practicable, is not overly different when, when we compare to the LNG industry, whether it's being the emergency shutdowns or the spill containment or safety distances, et cetera. All these concepts very much apply to the liquefied hydrogen case as well. Now, coming to our liquefied hydrogen carrier, the Swiss of Frontier. This is the picture of the Swiss of Frontier, which we have got on the screen. Other than the hydrogen related systems, the vessel is somewhat conventional. She is diesel electric. <clears throat> she is a small vessel, a, a demonstration vessel of about 110 meters long. <clears throat> and she can travel at about 13 knots. She's a Japan flag and class, classed by class NK. She has got one tank, as you can see on the, on the picture, which the capacity of the cargo containment system is 1,250 cubic meters, located in the forward hold at present. And she is a, the tank is a type C tank with a four bar pressure gauge rating for uh, carrying liquefied hydrogen at minus 253 degrees centigrade. He has got a vacuum uh, insulation uh, with multi-layer insulation in it. And outside it has got a Kawasaki panel system as a secondary, as a backup uh, or emergency insulation. Boil of gas management philosophy on this vessel is predominantly based on pressure retention. So we, we hold uh, the hydrogen uh, within the tank and then uh, basically discharges uh, uh, to the terminal uh, during the cargo operations. Uh, either it's before loading or uh, before discharging uh, the cargo from the ship. So let me focus a little bit on the liquefied hydrogen part of the vessel and the, and the key novel technologies which, which have been installed or utilized in the project. Liquefied hydrogen is stored at minus 253 degrees centigrade at around ambient pressure conditions. And at such low temperatures, air liquefies and freezes. Liquefied nitrogen, liquefied oxygen are formed depending on what temperatures around minus 196 at ambient conditions is for liquefied nitrogen minus 183 ish is for liquefied oxygen. And they both causes risks to the assets. As we all know, it can cause embrittlement cold embrittlement and also on safety because liquefied oxygen especially is 
is something which can accelerate uh, the fire or the propensity to burn. In addition to that extremely low temperature, another challenge what we have got with hydrogen is latent heat of vaporization, which is roughly about 10 times more prone for evaporation as compared to LNG case. These characteristics of hydrogen has necessitated project to design cargo containment system, cargo piping, and other cargo equipment where heat and ingress has got to be reduced to avoid that boil of generation or the loss of cargo. All means either conduction, convection, or radiation, we had to reduce it and hence predominantly all, all the cargo tank, cargo systems uh, are vacuum insulated. Material selection indeed has to incorporate not only cold uh, embrittlement, but also hydrogen embrittlement risks, which also has required or necessitated certain works or certain studies to be conducted within the project. Our vacuum insulation goes all the way from cargo containment systems to the manifold. Even the manifold is double walled to reduce that heat ingress and also to add as a protection for loss of containment. Where on one end, all these protections have been provided, on the other end, emergency preparedness has been considered and installed whether it being detection methods or whether it's being drip trace uh, for prevention or for mitigation against the uh, embrittlement of the ship decks or ship material, which is not designed for cryogenic temperatures, for example, in case of vacuum loss. Due to the high flammability range of hydrogen, which is 4% to 75%, a strong emphasis has been given to the mitigatory and recovery measures. This has included hazardous area classification on board ship, ventilation arrangement within the cargo machinery spaces and gas detection philosophy. For hazardous area classification, we have utilized IEC standards. But we have not only relied on the IGC code and the recommendation, we have also used the first principles and dispersion analysis studies. We determined to extend the hazardous distance of gas danger zone around vent mast, taking into account of a difference in release characteristics of the hydrogen. In addition, the safety location of vent mast was also assessed and adjusted accordingly. For the cargo machinery room ventilation, we, valid we validated the duration uh, ventilation and hydrogen detector locations within the, within the cargo machinery room by using the CFD analysis. Purging and sampling is different to LNG practice because we have introduced a complete closed system here. With all these novel elements, novel technologies, first times on in a marine environment, it has required certain amount of analysis, safety studies, and other studies which were which have been conducted uh, to ensure that these uh, technologies will deliver as, as anticipated. Marine standards are not well developed for, uh, for this space, which is the carriage of liquefied hydrogen. And hence, industry standards like ASME, ISO, aerospace, and from hydrogen retail industry has been utilized to gain the guidance which could be utilized in our project. Third parties who are experienced in managing liquefied hydrogen have been collaborated with for the benefit and safety of the project. Type approval testing, factory acceptance testing, et cetera, has all been conducted. 
In addition to that, and before that, where possible, project has also utilized the liquefied hydrogen testing. For example, LS2 tests were conducted on prototype cargo pumps, cargo metering equipment, sensors, etc. But it's also worth highlighting the fact that such facilities for appropriate testing are very, very limited for liquefied hydrogen and has been a challenge. To the point that all technologies couldn't be fully tested, especially the, the bigger uh, the bigger scale, which requires bigger flow rates or, or bigger amounts of liquefied hydrogen. And hence, some of these testings have been included in the demonstration tests, which I will shortly cover. And these demonstration tests were critical for demonstration of these technologies and taken a considerable time in demo tests, demonstration tests, before we go into the operations phase. Coming to the ship operations, what we have got here is somewhat which the industry is well aware of. It's quite similar to the LNG industry. This includes normal operations of loading, seagoing, unloading operations. For seagoing part in this vessel, as I have mentioned, we are retaining the boil of gas. So we are not consuming and the, the boil of gas as a fuel on this particular vessel. Coming to the out of service operations like pre post dry dock operations, there are some additional considerations there. However, most of the elements are similar to LNGC practice, which normally starts with the healing out and then warming it up. Rate of temperature rise and warm up is indeed dependent on the on the tank and uh, and the manufacturer recommendations, which in this case will be much longer uh, because of the high temperature differential and also depending on the technology utilized. After warm up will be the inerting, which will be again similar. All operations are anticipated to be alongside and has been carried out alongside in this case so far, where the gas has been returned to shore for management. Aeration will utilize normal practices, moving from nitrogen to air. Post dock, again, inerting with very similar as, as as we do that for LNG carriers, predominantly, but with nitrogen. Now, gassing up is more intense and necessary in this case, because any leftover nitrogen will freeze, liquefy or freeze eventually within the system, causing problems in the complete cargo handling system. So this step is somewhat uh, different, which and, in, and requires uh, a high level of uh, cleanliness and perfection to remove the nitrogen appropriately. After gassing up, will be cooled down. And again, rate will be as per manufacturer's recommendations and to, to manage the, the cargo tank and the systems uh, in a, within the safe margins. However, overall duration wise, the duration take, which it takes is, is considerably longer uh, as compared to the uh, uh, operations which are uh, relevant for LNGCs. Comparing the two practices and just very, very high level. We are building on the excellent safety history of LNGC industry here. And all the key aspects of LNGC cargo operations and safety elements are also included in the liquefied hydrogen operations, like provision of vapor return or ESD1, ESD2 emergency shutdowns, which is more around 
stopping the cargo in case of any abnormality or even separation of the vessel in case of a emergency shutdown too. To avoid the possibility of any potential release of hydrogen, which can be at the manifolds, for example, purging times or during testing, etc., we are taking this step of having a complete closed system for purging and sampling. Anything which is to be released either gets returned to the terminal or it goes to the ship's vent mast for safe release. Gas detection has provided for all the at-risk places and considering any potential leaks from flanges as well. So this is yet again something different, uh, which we don't have in case of our, uh, on LNG ships. And this is also uh, the roots of it goes back to some aerospace industry as well. On one hand, we have minimized those flanges, but where those flanges are unavoidable, those flanges have been protected from leak detection in addition uh, to, to the normal practice. All these cargo piping are double wall design. Uh, so this, uh, on one end, it reduces the heat ingot. On the other end, it also provides a double wall for uh, in case of a leak uh, scenario. So it gives added protection. When inner pipes are not visible by the crew anymore uh, as compared to our LNGC practice, and also considering the additional temperature differentials, uh, provisions have been made uh, around the protection of inner pipe from uh, excessive cool down, uh, from bowing of the pipes, uh, and such uh, equipment and sensors have been, have been provided in the system. Part of the project has been the development of the liquefied hydrogen terminal because there is no place in the world where the ship could have gone. So the hydrogen terminal, the pictures what we see on the screen is the, is the whole first marine hydrogen, liquefied hydrogen terminal, which has been built in Kobe. Uh, her name is High Touch Kobe. And it was built on an artificial island of Kobe airport. And they started operations is being managed and operated by Iwatani Corporation, a founding member of Hystra. This terminal has got one liquefied hydrogen storage tank, uh, one loading arm system, which was again unique uh, for, for carriage of liquefied hydrogen and is utilizing a vacuum insulation system completely. It's a hose-based system, as you can see in the picture. This terminal has been designed and it has gone its own commissioning and testing process and later on utilized for the commissioning and demonstration tests for the Suiso Frontier. The terminal has got a vent stack, which is also utilized for any venting, which is uh, related from the cargo operations carried out with the ship. Certainly got a gas holder and other equipment which are uh, necessary to operate the terminal. The picture which uh, shows the Suiso Frontier next to the terminal uh, is, uh, is, is the start of the demonstration tests. After the construction period and, and all the challenges of installation commissioning, Suiso Frontier has gone into the demonstration test, which we termed as de demo one. So the first phase of the demonstration test, which has started in second half of 2021 and were concluded in Q4 2021. The vessel has conducted a series of operations utilizing all the cargo systems 
and verif verifying and validating various technologies alongside the terminal, the high-touch Kobe, and also has included a fully loaded voyage. So this was also to conduct several tests on the cargo containment system and also to understand the boil of gas generation and to verify it against the theoretical or calculations. Pressure retention was tested for a period of up to three weeks. And this was also part of the test which were conducted during demonstration tests one. Afterwards, and after completion of successful testing uh, and understanding any gaps and learnings from it, demonstration phase two started. And demonstration phase two was the first international voyage by the ship to Australia, which was the core objective of this project or one of the core objectives of this project, which is the demonstration of international bulk transportation of liquefied hydrogen via marine transport, which started from cargo loading at Kobe terminal. And the voyage all the way to Hastings, Australia, where we carried out some depressurization of the tank and then partial loading operations at the port of Hastings. Other than the cargo operations, the bunking operation on route was also carried out. And earlier in Q1, last month, basically, we have completed the cargo discharging operation at Kobe terminal safely, which has basically concluded the demonstration phase two of the testing safely and successfully. Looking ahead after this, perhaps there's, there's a plan uh, for, for conducting more tests when it comes to the pilot project and, and building up that reliability and confidence on various items. There's also an element, as I have mentioned in the HESC part about moving to the next steps of uh, scaling up uh, towards, uh, towards the next stage. One of the key elements when, when I look at it from marine uh, rules and regulations perspective has been a challenge of uh, adequate rules and regulations in the marine space for carriage of liquefied hydrogen. And back in 2015, 2016 timeframe, we have gone through the IMO process and, and have developed and come out with our interim guidelines uh, for the carriage of liquefied hydrogen in bulk which have been the cornerstone and have been utilized for uh, within the uh, within the design and construction of this vessel. But certainly they, there's a way to go there. And, and this uh, pilot project uh, is expected to, to deliver uh, the data and learnings, which can certainly be incorporated uh, during the next steps for the development of rules and regulations in this space. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Amma, for a, uh, an interesting uh, presentation. We've had um, some questions already, and, and I would encourage anyone else, while, while we stop, start with these questions, if they've got any of their own, to, to also post those. Um, so the first question um, is going back to the, the risk chart. So the question is, um, the risk comparison seems rather somewhat unbalanced um, compared to, for example, risk charts produced in the aerospace industry, as it does not seem to take full account of the speed of dispersion adequately, i.e. the duration of the risk when compared with LNG. Is this a valid concern? Uh, will this be reflected in the final refinement of this chart and how will these limits be determined? Thank you very much for the question. And certainly uh, an element which I have mentioned earlier is a subjective comparison. 
So qualitative analysis are ongoing and, and, and indeed uh, that will be part of our uh, next evaluations and, and next steps. Uh, this is merely touching higher level on these elements to get the message across. Uh, the qualitative is indeed the next step. And a number of uh, areas where we, ha we haven't had uh, the information, there are various industry uh, programs going on or, and some internally in the, in the various companies as well, uh, which are basically uh, quantifying those risks and perhaps those elements will get feedback or already have feedback in, in, into some of those uh, assessments which we carry out. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is um, relating to uh, vented hydrogen. And so the question is, can the vented hydrogen not be used for propulsion? Are hydrogen turbines available? I assume that fuel cells are not yet sufficiently developed at the required power levels. Indeed, thank you very much again for the question and and very, very interesting topic of today is around uh, the utilization of hydrogen as fuel. However, I mean, in this project, everything which we have touched on the hydrogen space has, has been novel. So the, the decision has been in, in, the, in this phase not to not to go there. It's kind of uh, learn how to walk before we run kind of thing. So carriage of cargo has been uh, as part of the current phase. Certainly uh, the next steps and also uh, we are working and I'm sure many other parties are working as well around the utilization of hydrogen as fuel. But for this vessel, uh, certainly it's, uh, it's not being utilized as, as fuel. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, as a more general question, how does LN2 compare with liquefied NH3 as a carbon free option? I guess that's a very wider topic of discussion, probably out of the remit, I would say here, because uh, certainly uh, all, all, all the fuels, uh, time will tell which, uh, which fuel uh, will, will basically make the market, because they, they, or maybe all of the fuels will, uh, may have uh, its own place. Um, so something, uh, I guess, a little bit of a uh, crystal ball uh, gazing as well, time will tell uh, where the industry is going to go. But uh, certainly both the fuels can offer uh, some potential benefits uh, in comparison to uh, the aims regarding uh, or with reference to the uh, CO2 uh, reduction. Thank you. Uh, moving on. So the next question is, I have formed the impression that the transport of liquid hydrogen is going to be very expensive, bearing in mind such requirements as the need to cool it to minus 250 degrees degrees centigrade. Bearing this in mind, do you think that ammonia is perhaps a better alternative as it can be also generated with renewable energy but can be transported at ambient temperatures? Yeah, again, I think uh, probably uh, I would say again out of the remit of this discussion, but uh, but a, a question which is being posed to the industry, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very big question which is, uh, which is under discussion. Um, and certainly, uh, everything has got merits and demerits. Uh, difficult to, to, to cover it all here. Uh, but I, as I mentioned, maybe, maybe all options may have its own place. Liquefying hydrogen certainly takes energy. And uh, at the same time, there are some, some other elements which, which again needs to be considered uh, when, when we are considering the ammonia. Okay. And uh, we've got one more, I oh, know, two more questions, okay. So the next question is, what are the likely future major design changes following lessons learned from this project? I think there, 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 are, key, uh, there are a few key elements there. Um, one thing is, is indeed the upper scaling part, as, as we know that uh, this, uh, this vessel has only uh, considered a, a small scale. Uh, and also considered uh, the technologies, for example, CCS is a type C tank. Uh, we all understand the type C has got its limitations in times of carriage of volumes. Uh, so there will, be, uh, there will be elements of novel technologies where we have to go to uh, for, for future commercial vessels. 
the learnings which we have got from, from safety considerations and the safety studies uh, conducted certainly will, will have a bearing on the, uh, on the subsequent projects and also uh, should also show up in the rules and regulations development for the wider uh, utilization in the community. So, so yes, I think there they, they will be learnings uh, or there they have been learnings which will, which will impact for the, uh, for the upcoming vessels. Um, okay, uh, the next question is, um, have there been any surprises in the initial trials? Well, I, I think there have been learnings and there have been difficulties uh, around uh, various elements uh, in the, in, during the test. And that is why tests have taken a bit longer than, uh, than we have initially accounted for. Uh, however, um, it has all been conducted uh, safely. So there hasn't been any major surprise, let me put it this way, but, but there have been learnings around various elements uh, all the way along. Thank you. And the next question is, when did this project start? What is the future timescale and cost? So this project, I think the concept was back in 2009. It has almost taken a decade uh, through various discussions and uh, the construction phase has started back in the end of 2017. Uh, and now we have completed the, all the demonstrations in February 2022, so last month. So it has taken almost a decade. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't comment on the cost part. Uh, uh, all the commercial elements are out of the scope of the technical discussion here. Uh, and uh, future-wise, I think certainly it does take time uh, for the new concepts for upscaling the vessel. Uh, and and certainly it will uh, it will take good amount of time. It's it's not going to happen tomorrow or next year or, or the year after. It will take a good amount of years uh, before probably the next the next ship comes out or, or a bigger ship comes out. Thank you. Um, that was the last of the questions that I have so far. So I just like to to thank you once again for for your lecture. Um, our next lecture which will be on the 5th of April, is going to be uh, given by someone from the MAIB and, and will be on uh, the, the, how they investigate uh, various marine casualties. So that should, should hopefully be very, very interesting to us all. Um, so without further ado, I think I'll, I'll close the session now and uh, thank you all for attending. This has been recorded and uh, will be uploaded to YouTube. So look out for, for the email that should go around next week sometime with details of the next lecture and also the YouTube link for, for this presentation. And we had a couple of thank yous coming in from people for you, Amir. So yes, thank you once again for giving us <laughs> your time and, and for, for such an interesting talk. So good night. Well, thank, you. thank you. Good night to you all.